in Acts 7, 54 through 60, we find the record of the martyrdom of Stephen. Now, when they had heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, they called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, we've covered several aspects of this passage over the course of the last few weeks, but today I want to talk about what happened to Stephen in terms of aspiration. We just got finished singing Faith of Our Fathers. And the second verse of that hymn says, Our fathers, chained in prisons dark, were still in heart and conscience free. How sweet! would be their children's fate if they, like them, could die for thee. Now, the wording here to me seems odd. Because though Frederick William Faber, the author of this hymn, was surely Christian, he for some reason makes a pronoun switch in this verse. Because instead of using the first-person plural pronoun, we, he uses the hypothetical third-person pronoun, they. But why? I mean, we, the singers of this hymn, along with Faber, the author of the hymn, are the children in the faith of our forefathers. We aren't singing about someone else. We're singing about ourselves. This isn't an abstraction. This is real and personal. The martyrs being lionized aren't somebody else's fathers. They're our fathers. And with that in view, it would seem to me most natural if he were to have written to him here, having referred to the children of the fathers, not as they, but as we. How sweet would be their children's fate if we, like them, could die for thee. Both grammatically and logically, that would have been the most correct and the most obvious word choice. So why did Faber use the word they instead? I mean, look at the overall wording of the hymn. Faber's admiration of the church fathers is clear, as is his admiration for those who have given their lives for the Christian faith. Indeed, he seems to have had a rather romanticized view of martyrs of the past, holding them and their deaths in high esteem. And it appears that he held the notion of dying a martyr's death to be a noble notion, one to which the Christians of his day ought to have aspired, at least in reverie. So it seems curious to me that he would equivocate in his hymnautical identification with these theoretical potential martyrs of his generation by referring to them not as we, but as they. I mean, it's not like the possibility of being martyred was all that remote for Faber. Yes, the martyrs he seems to be most familiar with were those of the distant past, but there were high-profile Christian martyrs in Faber's lifetime that he as a church leader in England would surely have known about. Some 10,000 Christians were put to death in Korea in five waves of persecution between 1791 and 1866. On April 22, 1821, Georgios Angelopoulos, ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople, while leading a church service in in Constantinople, was accosted by Ottomans and was lynched at the main gate of the church. 
By order of the Sultan, his body was left hanging at the door of the church until he was eventually taken down and transported to Athens for burial. On October 18, 1836, a 12-year-old girl named Terore, daughter of Maremu Nagaku, a chief of the Maori Iwi tribe of the North Island of New Zealand, along with 24 of her classmates at the Church Missionary Society, were kidnapped, tortured, and ritually mutilated for their faith by rival tribe members of an Iwi Iwi cannibal tribe. Sidhom Bache, a Coptic Orthodox Christian, was put to death in Damietta, Egypt in 1844. He was publicly flogged, then strapped to a buffalo facing the tail and paraded, and paraded around Damietta while being insulted and humiliated by a hostile Muslim crowd. Eventually, molten tar was poured over his head and he was left outside the door of his home where he succumbed to his injuries five days later. And Agatha Lynn and Lawrence Wang Bing were evangelists who were famously beheaded in Gizhou, China in 1858 for teaching against Confucianism. All of these incidents and more were reported in the papers and Faber, as a prominent leader of the Anglican Church, surely knew about them. So he knew that being martyred was a real and present reality for Christians around the world in his lifetime. So why did he opine the sweetness of the potential martyrdom of his contemporaries in the third person and not in the first person? Why they and not we? Well, I'm not a licensed, so take this with a grain of salt. But in lay psychological terms, I think the answer is fairly obvious. This is a classic Freudian slip. Now, just for the sake of clarity, when my mother graduated from KU with her dual master's degree in social work and psychology, my father bought her, among other gifts, a chemise with a larger-than-life portrait of the father of modern psychology on it. That was a Freudian slip. But that, <laughs> but that is not the sort of Freudian slip that Faber made in the second verse of Faith of Our Fathers. Rather, Faber made a slip of the tongue, or in this case, a slip of the pen, an unintentional error regarded as revealing subconscious feelings, which is another way of saying that he accidentally told on himself. Because what this pronoun switch indicates to me is that while Faber regarded martyrdom as a noble death for Christians to die, which sort of death he would admired if suffered by a peer he himself did not wish to undergo such death. He's able to say that of the faith available to the children of our fathers, martyrdom in the abstract would be a sweet death for them in the third person. But he cannot bring himself to proclaim the same in the first person. He cannot bring himself how sweet would be their children's fate if we, like them, could die for thee. As Jesus tells us in Luke 6, 45, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, before I go any further, I just want to make it clear for the record that I'm not standing here this morning to make an indictment of Frederick Faber. Faber, as far as I can tell, was a churchman of good conscience who took great personal risks for his own faith in his life and career. For instance, in 1845, while he was serving as an ordained clergyman of the Anglican Church, he converted to Catholicism, renounced his Anglican vows, and two years later in 1847 was ordained into the Catholic priesthood. And he paid a hefty personal price for doing so in terms of friends, family, and fraternity. Now, that is a personal choice and a vocational choice that may be difficult for us to appreciate. It's like choosing the Titanic over the Lusitania. 
but you can't deny that he had the courage of his convictions in making that choice. But everyone's faith has an upper limit. And for Faber, though he was willing to give up a lot for his faith, it was not required of him. And given the opportunity to muse upon the making of such a sacrifice, he declined to include himself in the set of those for whom such an offering would surely be sweet. And in my understanding, that slight deviation points to a deeper disconnect, a disconnect between admiration and aspiration. Because Faber admired the martyrs, he admired those who had given their lives for the sake of Jesus' name, but he didn't want to be one of them. That is, he admired martyrdom, but he didn't aspire to it. Nevertheless, he thought it was admirable, admirable enough that more people, other people, ought to aspire to it. But he never quite worked that ambivalence out, or at least he hadn't quite worked it out before 1849 when he wrote the hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. And this is the problem that I want to talk about this morning. This is something I can really relate to because I understand Faber's dilemma here. I understand his ambivalence because just like Faber, I too admire martyrs. I hold them in high esteem. And just like Faber, I don't aspire to martyrdom. I don't want to die a martyr's death. But that's where the similarity ends, because unlike Faber, I do not command martyrdom to others. I don't say, I don't think I could ever say, wouldn't it be great if more Christians were to die for the Lord? And why not? Well, because I understand that persecution and martyrdom are not virtues. They're circumstances. And circumstances aren't subject to personal aspiration. Virtues arise from within, but circumstances are imposed from without. A virtue is a pint, but a circumstance is a plight. And if you think that persecution and martyrdom are virtues, Worthy of aspiration, that is probably because of a faulty reading of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Because when it comes to the Beatitudes, we tend to put the cart before the horse. Because we tend to read the Beatitudes backward rather than forward. Now, what do I mean by that when I say that we tend to read the Beatitudes backward? What I mean is that we miss the point going out the gate. Then we home in on the part that appeals to us. Then we go back and try to reverse engineer the beginning so that it better vision that we've drawn from the ending. How so? Well, let's read through them and I'll show you. Matthew 5, starting at the beginning of the chapter. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain. And when he was set his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, 
For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Now I've heard lots of sermons on the Beatitudes, and every one of them puts the cart before the horse. Every one of them interprets the Beatitudes backward instead of forward, because they don't seem to know what a Beatitude is. So rather than reading the Beatitudes as Beatitudes, they read them as syllogisms. Now, a syllogism is a statement like this. All men are mortal. Billy Bob is a man, therefore Billy Bob is a mortal. When you read a Beatitude as a syllogism, you get something like this. All the pure in heart shall see God. Billy Bob is pure in heart, therefore Billy Bob shall see God. There are nine Beatitudes, so there are usually nine sermons, and they all go something like this. All the pure in heart shall see God. You want to see God, don't you? Therefore, you need to become pure in heart. Now, there's nothing wrong with a sermon like that. Well, except for two things. That isn't what Jesus said. And that isn't what Jesus meant by what he did say. But people have gotten this wrong over and over throughout the history of the church. Now, this is the easiest uh, to recognize when, when you see um, when you see it in its most extreme and most absurd examples, because the formula, the syllogism that I stated above, wrong-headed as it is, at least makes sense when the antecedent, when the condition part of the syllogism, can be a virtue. For instance, blessed are the gentle. Well, that makes sense because gentleness can be a virtue. And we can all see how it is that by being more gentle, we could make the world a better place. And what's the harm in preaching that we should be gentle? Well, don't be ridiculous. Of course, we should be gentle. And of course, only good can come from a sermon on how to be more gentle. The harm comes from preaching that the Beatitudes is a list of virtues, which virtues once attained reap certain rewards. Now, with the Beatitude, this starts out okay. The meek shall inherit the, the earth, therefore be meek. The merciful shall receive mercy, therefore be merciful. The pure in heart shall see God, therefore be pure in heart. The peacemakers shall be called sons of God, therefore be peacemakers. Those statements, those syllogisms all make sense to us, make sense to us because meekness, mercifulness, Purity of heart and peacemaking are all virtues, attainable virtues, at least to some degree. But that kind of reasoning begins to fail when we look at the other five Beatitudes. The poor in spirit shall inherit the kingdom of God, therefore impoverish yourself spiritually. Those who mourn shall be comforted, therefore Find something to be sad about and go into mourning. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be satisfied. Therefore, change your spiritual appetites. Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, though they'll have to share it with the poor in spirit. Nevertheless, if you can't achieve spiritual poverty, you can surely find some way to bring about your own persecution. Those who are persecuted for Jesus' sake will have a reward in heaven. Therefore, you need to go out and get yourself persecuted for Jesus' sake. Now, you see the problem, don't you? These other five Beatitudes are obviously not virtues. But this hasn't stopped people from trying to turn them into virtues. Take, for instance, blessed are those who mourn. People have come up with the craziest ideas about this statement of Jesus because they imagine that all the Beatitudes are virtues, and so mourning must be a virtue. And this has led people in every generation to adopt all kinds of very severe and negative ideas about joy and happiness 
This is where you get societies like the Amish and the Mennonite faiths, in which expressions of joy and happiness are considered suspect, if not sinful, because they're frivolous and proud. Or the Puritans, among whom it was taught that all laughter is derision, that all laughter is at somebody else's expense, and that since all men are created in the image of God, then to laugh is to mock God's handiwork, or even to mock God himself. And this was taken very seriously. If you were to laugh in public in a Puritan township, you just might find yourself in the stocks, or the cucking stool. Or the ascetics of the Middle Ages who treated themselves very severely to suppress feelings of joy and pleasure, beating themselves, whipping themselves, binding themselves up in torturous garb, wearing hair shirts, which would be kind of like wearing a shirt made of fiberglass insulation. It creates thousands of tiny little cuts on the skin and burns and it itches. Or just take the civil codes of the 17th through 19th centuries, which mandated, for instance, that a widow must remain in mourning for her husband for a full year. She must wear black for that entire time and must not be seen at any frivolous social functions. And why? Well, because Jesus said mourning is a virtue. The only problem is Jesus never said that. Well, what about blessed are the poor in spirit? Now, I've read an awful lot about what Jesus might have meant when he referred to the poor in spirit, and I'm persuaded that what he means when he uses the phrase poor in spirit is poor in spirit. Spiritually poor, spiritually impoverished, poverty-stricken, spiritually speaking, spiritually bankrupt. Those who are poor in spirit are spiritual paupers, spiritual ciphers, spiritual zeros. Beloved, spiritual poverty is not a virtue to be strived for. Now, it isn't a sin either. It's a condition. It's a state of being, a circumstance in which one finds himself after suffering a long bout of spiritual malnourishment. Spiritual poverty is the pathology of spiritual deprivation. And there's nothing virtuous about being poor in spirit. But that hasn't stopped people from trying to make a virtue of it. And there are two ways that people attempt to make a virtue of spiritual poverty. The first way is by entering into severe disciplines of quietness, silence, and meditation, which are good things but they're not intended to create emptiness. They're intended to create fullness. Keeping silence before the Lord isn't about impoverishing yourself spiritually. It's about allowing God to enrich you spiritually. Nevertheless, stating very early or starting very early in the Christian, in Christianity, groups of Christians arose who attempted to achieve this virtue as they saw it by depriving themselves of speech of the company of others, of food, of comforts, of joy, of ordinary pleasurable experience, enjoying entertainment, socializing, playing games, laughing, celebrating good things, enjoying one's food. You see this in early Christian monasticism and in traditions like the Shaker tradition and the Quaker tradition but you also see remnants of it in our own tradition. Why do you think our church buildings are so plain? Because our buildings are an extension and expression of our spiritual values. And through the ages, we've inherited this idea that spiritual poverty is a virtue. Now, we've couched it in terms of the virtue of frugality, but nowhere in the Bible is frugality praised, particularly in regard to faith and practice. Rather, it is excess and extravagance which is praised when it comes to faith and practice. That's why what the woman with the alabaster box did 
when she poured out a whole year's wages on the feet of Jesus, is to be taught wherever the gospel is taught. Not because she was frugal, but be, and not because she was parsimonious. She didn't pour out one fiftieth of that pure nard, put some on Jesus' feet and say, now I can do this every week for a year. And if she had, there's no way Jesus would have patted her on the head and say, well, bless your pea-picking little heart. He'd have said, what are you waiting for? Get she didn't sow spiritual poverty in her act of worship, and Jesus never commends spiritual poverty as a virtue to which we ought to strive. Now, the second way people have tried to make a virtue of spiritual poverty is by rewording this particular beatitude so that it reads, blessed are those who know they are poor in spirit. And this has led people down tragic paths of spiritual pride. And you all know people like this. People so eager to express their spiritual shortcomings that they deny that they have any spiritual virtue. People so caught up in acknowledging their spiritual poverty and so convinced that such acknowledgement is pleasing to God that they'll be angry with you if you deny them their boast and give them a compliment. That isn't a virtue. That isn't humility. Moses was the humblest man who ever lived. And you know how we know that? He told us so. In Numbers 12, 3, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And after the Exodus, you never hear Moses denying his own spiritual credentials. Denial of the truth isn't a virtue. And if God has blessed you spiritually, there's no virtue in denying that he has. Not only that, but all the Beatitudes are worded in exactly the same way, and you can't honestly add to the words who know they are to the first Beatitude without adding it to all of them. If it's blessed are those who know they are poor in spirit, then it's got to be blessed are those who know they mourn, and blessed are those who know they are meek, and blessed are those who know that they hunger and thirst after righteousness. And that brings us to the final beatitude, the mother of them all when it comes to people trying to make virtues out of beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness' sake, or for Jesus' sake. Now, this is something that I take very seriously because right now, every day, there are Christians in various places around the world who are losing their freedom, their property, and even their lives simply for being Christian. And I believe that there are special rewards in heaven for those who die a martyr's death. That's a clear indication from Revelation 2, 8 through 11, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, and Revelation 24. And I realize that our own society is becoming less and less Christian friendly. And that to say, I am a Christian, can, under the right circumstances, bring you ridicule and derision. And maybe even something worse, maybe even cancellation of some kind. But I haven't heard of anyone being arrested for being Christian or losing their home for going to church or being killed for saying Jesus is Lord. Now a day may be coming when more and more Christians will be persecuted for righteousness sake, but that day will come soon enough on its own. And there's nothing virtuous about trying to hasten the day. But I see people trying to do that all the time. Picking fights with the world on social media. Picking imaginary fights with imaginary foes and stating how they would answer a critic if they ever happened to find one and were called to a challenge of their faith having imaginary debates with imaginary atheists, or picking fights with real atheists 
challenging them to debates and then posting clips of the debate online for clicks and likes. But beloved, being persecuted for Jesus' sake isn't a virtue to which you can aspire. It's a circumstance to which you are given. Being persecuted is a plight, not a plight. Now, to plight is to plant your stake in the ground, to pitch your tent. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Stephen's sermon, after he had been arrested, was a pite. His faith was a pite. And his pite was a virtue. But the fact that he was under arrest in the first place, that was his plight. The fact that the world hates God and hates the name of Jesus Christ, his son, that's a plight. And the fact that in response to Stephen's faith and faithfulness, the Sanhedrin and their gathered mob put Stephen to death is a plight. Not a plight. And a plight isn't a virtue. It's a circumstance. Jesus never teaches us that we ought to aspire to a plight. He tells us to plant our flag in the ground and build our house on the solid rock of his word. That's our plight. And that's my lesson for today.